Hi, everyone. I'm Derek Chalet at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome today Rebecca Lisner, who's the co-author of a terrific new book uh, with Mira Rapp Hooper, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for the 21st Century Order. So I'm just going to show it right here. Uh, it is a terrific book uh, that Rebecca and Mira have written uh, that talks both about our current moment, how we got here, but most importantly, what the pathway ahead should look like uh, toward building what they call an open world order. So uh, Rebecca is a uh, assistant professor at the US Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. She's joining us today from the North Fork of Long Island uh, where she's riding out COVID with her family. Um, and I should say at the outset, this is a disclaimer, uh, the US Naval War College is of course a government institution, but Rebecca is here in her personal capacity, her book nor her comments here reflect the official positions of the US government. Is that a good disclaimer, Rebecca? Is that, Perfect, thank you. I've done, I've done that myself, so don't, don't, no worries. Um, so uh, Rebecca and I are gonna have a conversation. Uh, I wanna fold in questions and comments from you, the viewers. So please, uh, when you have them, put them in the Q&A uh, uh, of the chat function here, and uh, we'll take them in and fold them into the conversation. Um, Rebecca, why don't I start things off by the title, uh, An Open World. Um, now, you, you, you place our current moment in the context of, of the debate about global orders in the past and how previous orders have, have collapsed and new ones taken shape. So what what is an open world in your mind? And you talk about an openness strategy, which is of course the strategy you suggest is necessary to achieve an open world. Tell us a little bit about that, what that looks like. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much to Derek for having me today and to GMF and to all of you who are taking the time out of your days to partake in this conversation. It's really a pleasure to be here. So this book, An Open World, is really a call to action because COVID has revealed an international system that is quite simply on the brink of collapse. International cooperation on this existential challenge for many people is inadequate. International institutions have not proven fitting to the challenges we face. And great powers are at loggerheads with each other, with the US and China engaging in increasingly vitriolic rivalry. But the important thing to recognize is that much of this damage actually predated the pandemic and will be with us even if Donald Trump leaves office next year. So for the US to recover from the present crisis, it needs a new approach. It needs an approach that rejects both nationalism and nostalgia and instead embraces disciplined, globally engaged American leadership in defense of an open world. So briefly, what is an open world and what would an openness strategy seek to accomplish? Well, an openness strategy is a vision for where American foreign policy can go in a world in which it no longer has military and economic primacy, but still sets out to defend its most vital interests and values. So an openness strategy recognizes in essence that the US can only stay safe, secure, and prosperous in an open world. That means that first of all, all states should be able to make free and independent political choices without foreign interference in their domestic political processes or outright domination by more powerful nations. It means second, that international waterways, airspace and outer space should remain open accessible for all military and commercial transit. So countries like China should not be allowed to close off the South China Seas to international accessibility. And third, global cooperation should proceed through international institutions that are both transparent and modernized for 21st century challenges. So in all to realize these three pillars of an open world, an openness strategy recognizes that the US doesn't actually have to dominate the world militarily. It just needs to prevent other countries from do doing so while joining with like-minded allies and partners to build a powerful coalition for international openness. So how did we get here? I mean, I'd like to dig down a little bit on the diagnosis of, of the problem. I mean, it seems like an obvious question. It's something certainly we at GMF debate often. You know, what, the, why is the world order under stress? What are the drivers of that stress? How much of this can we blame on policy decisions versus just larger geostrategic trends that are irrespective of any choices a particular president might make? I mean, tell me a little bit about how you and Mira see the, how we got to this point. 
Absolutely. Well, the fact is that American primacy has been waning for some time now, as West to East power shifts and rapid technological change have undermined the US-led international order that has prevailed in large part since the end of the Cold War, although elements of it date back to World War II as well. And looking at the global power shifts, the most crucial phenomenon is the rise of China. It has experienced meteoric growth over the past several decades. Its military has grown in parallel. And today, its economy is already the world's largest by some measures. And although China rose within the US-led order, it now seeks to revise that order to better reflect its own power and preferences. And we see that, for example, in its effort to build islands and militarize the South China Sea, effectively seeking to remake the Asian regional order in a way that is friendlier to China. But it's not just the rise of China. There's also rapid technological change that is causing the structures of international cooperation to become rapidly outmoded. Mm -hmm. And whether we're talking about you know, the vast expansion of digital trade or the use of services like Zoom that we're using today to really become at the center of global business, or if we're talking about rapidly emerging technologies like AI or quantum computing, the fact is that our international institutions and norms and laws simply have not kept pace. Mm -hmm. And these two trends actually intersect with each other because as China is seeking to build an international order that better reflects its own power and preferences, it's doing so in a way that tries to leverage its own domestic model of technological authoritarianism to export it internationally and to build a system that is friendlier to it. So the U.S. needs to mount an effective response, not just to new technologies and not just to China, but recognizing that both of these phenomena have fundamentally weakened the international order that it has sought to uphold and a new approach is needed. Mm -hmm. But again, getting back to, to how we got here is, is what do you think the biggest mistakes that the U.S. has made, say, over the last 20 years that has led to this outcome? Or do you think that we we got here in some ways inevitably that that given the these larger trends that you're talking about given china's trajectory over the last 40 years that this moment uh was was not preventable but the, i want to push this back on you i mean do you think that there 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 are ways that the us could have responded differently that would have not led to this crisis moment and this kind of the necessity for this call to arms that your that your book is uh, so eloquently uh, doing? So it's a really great question. And a lot of the trends that we highlight in the book are themselves structural. The sure. United States entered the post-Cold War world at the peak of its power, but it was always the case that eventually the United States tenure as the world's uncontested superpower was going to come to an end because global power always diffuses away from a superpower. That's been a historical trend over time. But I think the question was how quickly was it going to happen? And what type of proactive steps was the United States going to take in order to try to lock in its advantages while it still had them? And in thinking about the pace of power diffusion, you have to look at the vast expenditures that the US has outlaid, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and these sort of endless wars on terror more generally, mm -hmm. as having been fundamentally distracting from the central challenge at hand, which was the rise of China and the need to modernize the architecture of international cooperation for a new age. So China was always going to rise, and the United States was probably always going to face some measure of peer competitor in Asia, but it mm -hmm. could have embarked upon this competition that we now so clearly find ourselves in from a much stronger position if we had effectively taken the early 2000s to invest in the sources of our strength, both domestically and internationally, um, and use those to head off the rise of China. Now, that being said, there have also been some more recent errors over the past four years where uh, the Trump administration has in many cases declined to renovate American power and renovate international institutions for the challenges that we now face. And in fact, in many ways, the Trump administration has taken the opposite approach, where mm -hmm. the US needs to be moving towards a foreign policy that relies more on diplomacy and less on military force. We've seen the continued militarization of American foreign policy under Donald Trump, with more than you know, 200,000 American troops still deployed overseas where the US needs to be investing in the sources of its domestic unity and strength. In many ways, President Trump has stoked domestic divisions um, and undermined our response to COVID, which has been quite devastating for the US economically and health-wise. 
um, and also where the U.S. needs to be leading the renovation of these legacy international institutions like the WTO or like the UN system. In many cases, the Trump administration has actually been withdrawing from those institutions and ceding the field to China. So mm -hmm. the U.S. remains very powerful. We have many sources of advantage, whether that is the dominant U.S. dollar, whether that is our still vibrant economy and university system, whether that's our international system of alliances or even our unrivaled globe spanning military, which can project power anywhere in the world. But we need to make good on those advantages. And that's mm -hmm. really what this book is about, how the U.S. can do so at a time when we still have them. Mm -hmm. Well, you've outlined a few things that in your answer there I want to pull the thread on. But before I get to that, I want to just drill down a little more on this, the broader concept of the open world. How is it different, this grand strategy that, that you and Mira are articulating in your book, how is it different than what has come before? Uh, I was struck when I was reading it, I, I thought to myself, I, Barack Obama would probably agree with almost every syllable of, of what you've written. Um, and so that gets me to thinking like, why have we been unsuccessful at this point in implementing such a strategy? But first, to, is, that, is that a true statement? Is, am, I, am I reading it correctly that that this is very different or that in fact, this is a call for a return to a tradition in some ways that, that we followed in the past. And then as a follow-up to that, uh, to the extent that there are, you could go more specific on the policy uh, recommendations that you have to achieve this broader construct, what policy changes would you suggest need to be made? You get very specific, offer some very specific ones, I should say in the book. So just to talk a little bit about those. Sure. Well. Both great questions. So I'll start with the first one about the sort of history of openness in American foreign relations. And it's a really astute question because openness does have a venerable tradition in American foreign policy going back many decades. At the end of World War II, as FDR was articulating his vision for what post-war organization would look like, the original concept was effectively one of openness and a notion that recognized that the Soviet Union would likely enjoy considerable influence in Eastern Europe, but that sought to keep the Soviet sphere open and permeable to American ideas and military access and commercial transit. Now, when the Iron Curtain descended, that vision of an open world and open Europe became impossible, and instead you had two opposing blocs that emerged for the remainder of the Cold War. And then with the Soviet Union's collapse, the United States came to embrace a strategy that was actually much more ambitious than openness. We pursued this notion of liberal universalism, the idea that American style political systems and markets were inexorably on the march, and that by participating in this so-called liberal international order, authoritarian states like China would themselves liberalize. Now, the problem is that in the intervening decades, that hope, that aspiration has been in many ways invalidated. And so what we do with this strategy is for the first time put openness at the center of American foreign policy at a time that it seems uniquely achievable because there's never been greater benefits to participating in an interdependent global economy. And there have never been higher barriers to the establishment of closed spheres of influence, especially via territorial conquest, which is very difficult to achieve. Now to the question of Barack Obama specifically, I certainly wouldn't read this book as a repudiation of the Obama foreign policy, so much as a recognition that the world has changed immeasurably since Barack Obama took office in 2009 and first was crafting you know, his first national security strategy and his initial vision that he campaigned on and set about to enact and you know, that Derek, you worked on as well. And a central, I guess, two central distinctions that I would hold up here. The first has to do with armed regime change, which is something that the Obama administration did do in Libya, but that an openness strategy recognizes as being ineffective. That much as we might like to live in a world of dem democracies, the United States is actually quite limited in its ability to change the internal character of other states' regimes and to do so through the use of military force. So that's one significant point of departure. The second has to do 
with China. And here, I think we have to understand that the Obama administration dealt with a China that was changing quite a bit over the course of his tenure. And as Xi Jinping rose to power in 2012, 2013, the Obama administration had to figure out what that meant for China's ambitions and capabilities going forward. But now you fast forward to 2020, and I think the implications of where China is going are much clearer. And so what an openness strategy does is basically put China at the center of American grand strategy, recognizing that China really is the chief antagonist to open that openness that exists in the world and seeks to fortify the United States domestically and also build the international architecture that will prevent China from closing off important spheres of the world, whether geographically or in technological terms, to outside access. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh uh, just a, one comment on the on the Obama experience, particularly with Libya, which I, I think you're right. And I think that it's interesting because that was, of course, an uh, intervention that Obama was not particularly enthusiastic about. Uh, our European allies in particular were much more enthusiastic about it than he was. And I think he, he, he said one of his greatest regrets as president was the way that Libya turned out, of course. And I think Libya very much explains Obama's reluctance to intervene in a place like Syria, which uh, I, I'd be interested to, at some point, get your take on whether, according to your strategy, that would be the correct move or not, if to have not intervened in Syria. Um, I guess probably yes, but I'd be curious to get your take. Um, now, you talked about China a bit already. You do a great job talking about it in the book, you and Mira do. Um, uh, but I'd like to also hear about your take on how some other of the big geostrategic players are looking at this at this problem set and kind of approaching this this issue. And I'm thinking in particular of Europe. We've got a lot of uh, viewers here uh, from Europe uh, interested. Europe's clearly looking at the same picture, and and how do they play in this? Also, Russia clearly, which is which is like one of the, you talked about the kind of move of China in the last decade to be more of a of a driver of change that it goes against our interests. Certainly Russia's role as a uh, uh, kind of a spanner in the works of, of an open system is, is very important. And then also a country like India, which you talk, which you talk also about in the book, but uh, you know, clearly two administ multiple administrations, going back to the George W. Bush administration, actually before that, the Clinton administration have worked to bring India more to the, to the high table of, of global politics. Um, how you see India's role in this emerging open order. Absolutely. So let me answer that sort of at a high level, and then we can dig into any of those countries in greater detail. But one of the central arguments of the book is that there is a global battle underway that pits forces of openness against forces of closure. And this battle is taking place within countries and also between countries. It's taking place in different regions and also in different functional domains like technology, internet governance, emerging technologies, and so on. So on the side of openness, we very clearly have American allies in Europe, especially Germany, uh, but we also have allies in Japan or in Asia, like Japan, who are fighting to keep the international system open through a variety of means, but are frankly struggling to do so as the United States increasingly retreats and look inward. Similarly, you have countries like Russia and China that are inc increasingly cooperating with each other for closure. But it's important to recognize that there is a really big distinction to be made between Russia and China here. Because whereas China is actively pioneering a vision of international governance that lends itself to closure, Russia is much more a spoiler and is seeking to undermine in particular the European security order through various subconventional affronts, but doesn't really have an affirmative vision or the ability to bring it about on the global stage. And then you have other really interesting hinge states like India, which is itself aligned with the United States and with visions of openness on some issues. For example, India is increasingly, given its frictions with China, on board with a free and open Indo-Pacific concept and wants to dedicate resources to try to keep those global commons open. But at the same time, we have to recognize that despite being a democracy, India is liberalizing in some really important ways. And for example, its prolonged internet shutdowns in the country make its approach to internet governance look in many ways much more like China's vision or Russia's vision of cyber sovereignty. 
So what this amounts to is actually a complicated picture, one where the US has some very powerful allies on the side of openness if we want to rally them behind us, but also where countries' regime types or their identities as either democracies or authoritarian states don't neatly predict where they're going to align on the most important questions of openness versus closure. So it's a complex picture, and it's one in which middle powers are going to play an increasingly important role particularly as we think about building new forms of order in new spaces, like in the technological domain, like in rebuilding the global trade regime, like in global climate, the countries that are key players in those efforts aren't always gonna be the countries that have the very largest GDPs or the most powerful militaries. In many cases, they're going to be countries that are capable of being effective actors when it comes to diplomacy and development, or countries that have really advanced tech sectors and are therefore able to set new standards that have global adherence. So it's a complex picture, but the U.S. does have many traditional allies who will very much be crucial partners in this effort. It's a great point. I mean, what are some of the examples of countries that are, you know, not thought of as the big players that you would identify as the ones to watch is, is critical for the shaping of this open order? That's a great question. I mean, in some ways you could think about Japan, which is itself not a very powerful military force because it has actually constitutional restrictions on its ability to uh, build up military power, but nevertheless has established itself as a pillar of openness in Asia. You have the way in which uh, Tokyo has taken over sort of TPP and turned it into CPTPP and tried to keep that notion of an open trading order in Asia alive, even in the absence of the United States, and also the way in which Japan has pioneered development alternatives to BRI in seeking to provide countries in Asia and especially in Southeast Asia with a choice so that they actually have alternatives to Chinese infrastructure investment and so that that mix is more competitive. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you could think about allies in Europe, like Germany, which also you know, doesn't have global military power projection capabilities, but nevertheless, is a major player when it comes to international diplomacy. It does have some military capabilities, which it can continue to expand and tailor in ways that are necessary for deterring and defending against those forms of Russian aggression that do exist. And it has a really highly developed economy with a formidable export capabilities and also a big tech sector. And so all of these together enable countries like Germany to really shape the future of international order if it wants to put forth a vision of openness, even though it doesn't necessarily have the you know, guns and tanks that might traditionally have been looked to as the measures of geopolitical power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about the U.S. here at home. And one of the things you do, I think, very importantly in this book is you talk about the importance of American domestic support for this strategy and the ways that our domestic debate here hinders the U.S. ability to implement this strategy and seize these opportunities that you present as before us. So I'd like to drill down a bit on what the domestic factors upending the U.S. role in the world or why is our dysfunction uh, so dangerous for U.S. foreign policy? And then also how, how you suggest we insulate our foreign policy while still being a democracy <laughs> from, this, uh, from, the, uh, this, from an open world strategy. Like how, how do we insulate some of the more um, uh, toxic elements of our domestic debate uh, from interfering with our ability to seize the opportunities before us? It's such an important question, Derek, and there's no, there's no debate that America's domestic dysfunction is hobbling it on the international stage, and we see that in vivid detail pretty much every day now. And there are two divisions in particular that we highlight in the book as being particularly important and determinative. The first is partisan polarization or the growing divide that separates Democrats and Republicans on so many issues. And we see this polarization manifest at the elite level in sort of growing separation between Democratic and Republican legislators. We see it on the mass level in the ways in which Democrats and Republicans now actively dislike each other through a phenomenon known as effective polarization. And we see it in the media environment where Democrats and Republicans consume totally different sources of news and increasingly have different sources of facts. 
And this polarization has many grievous effects, but some of them are quite manifest in our foreign policy. For example, it becomes very difficult for the US to develop and execute a long-term strategy if our policies swing wildly whenever the White House changes hands between a Democrat and a Republican. Another really critical example is foreign interference in our domestic electoral processes, because these fissures in the American polity between Democrats and Republicans actually make clear to foreign adversaries where they can intervene to stoke division, and it makes it so much harder for the U.S. to respond, as we've seen over the past four years, as we know that Russia intervened in the 2016 election, but the fact that they intervened to help President Donald Trump has meant that GOP legislators and the Trump administration itself has been really reluctant to crack down. But it's not just the partisan political divisions that are hampering the United States ability to project power internationally. It's also the divide that separates the domestic tech sector from the federal government. And particularly as non-military forms of power become increasingly important in the 21st century in all the ways that we've been discussing thus far, it becomes so essential for states to be able to leverage their domestic innovation bases for national security and foreign policy ends. And here we see decades worth of estrangement between mm -hmm. Silicon Valley and Washington DC, where the incentives of the two have become essentially uncoupled. Whereas during the Cold War, the U.S. government used to invest upwards of 2% of GDP in research and development and basic science, that number has dwindled over the course of the past several decades to now 0.7%, which is a remarkable reduction. And in the absence of federal investment in R&D and basic science, the private sector has filled its own gap. And a large part of that has been chasing foreign markets and foreign profits in ways that aren't always consistent with American interests and values. Mm -hmm. So what this amounts to is a pretty consistent picture. It's a United States that remains powerful in many ways, but that is operating tragically below its own capacity on the international stage. Mm -hmm. Now, you ask sort of what can we do to begin to mitigate this, especially while maintaining our democratic character. And it's so important. And frankly, you know, polarization is a really hard problem and there's no single policy instrument that's going to be able to solve it. But what we can try to do is try to insulate foreign policy from the worst forms of partisan polarization. And what that means is that we can try to lean on those areas where consensus continues to exist. For example, Democrats and Republicans still both think that the US should take an active role on the global stage. So that's something that the openness strategy certainly takes up as a mandate and a mandate that has public support. There are other things that the, uh, the US can do to try to make its strategy self-sustaining in some ways and more insulated from this volatility. For example, by making major upfront investments. If we are to make game-changing investments in AI or quantum computing, that will have the dual effect of putting the US on the right track for foreign policy reasons, and also beginning to bridge that gap between Silicon Valley and Washington DC that I just discussed. So there's, there's no magic wand that's gonna do away with the hyper-partisan atmosphere in Washington DC, but there are ways that we can try to embed our foreign policy in a web of greater consensus and a web of private sector and also international partners that make it in some ways self-sustaining regardless of who's in the White House. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious your thought on whether uh, you think that the partisan divide on America's grand strategy is worse today than it has been at other inflection points. I mean, we can go back to the late 30s, early 40s, whether we should intervene in World War II. The, the 1950s and whether the U.S. had the right posture on communism and a kind of a great, a, a kind of a hysterical paranoid moment, not unlike we've, we're experiencing now during the McCarthy era. Obviously, the late 1960s and the ferocious debates about U.S. foreign policy and, and what certain what countries were worth American blood and treasure, namely Vietnam. Of course, the debates in the early 1980s on nuclear weapons, the end of the Cold War. We can go to kind of any point in history and find a political divide. I do think sometimes those of us living in the moment, we sometimes have false nostalgia for, you know, eras where we, we seem to remember that it was all settled and there was this big consensus when in fact it was it was quite contested. But I'm just curious your take on the moment 
we're in now and whether you feel like there's something unique about it in terms of the degree of polarization when it affects our foreign policy. Absolutely. And it's such an important point. And there I would say that certainly having sharp debates over key American foreign policy choices is nothing new. We've had them since the founding of our republic, and we should have them because that is perfectly healthy in a democracy to debate these big grand strategic questions and to debate much smaller foreign policy questions. That's the marketplace of ideas, and that's part of the ingredient that has made the United States so successful over time. But what is new is the way in which those debates are so clearly divided along partisan lines. Because it used to be that you actually had remarkable contrast within a single party. You had more internationalist wings of the Republican Party in the early Cold War, and then you had the Taft isolationist wing of the Republican Party in the early Cold War. But what's different now is that Americans have so neatly sorted themselves into these opposing blocks of Democrats and Republicans that those debates are no longer about ideas, they're just about politics. And that impoverishes our debate in all kinds of different ways. And it also makes us much less flexible. And I think we also have to acknowledge that in many ways, the past four years and Donald Trump's sort of heterodox approach to foreign policy has made this worse because it's actually eroded some areas where there has been pretty decent consensus between Democrats and Republicans. So mm -hmm. think, for example, about alliances. Alliances have been the source of bipartisan agreement. Um, of course, there have always been debates about the specifics, but generally speaking, Democrats and Republicans have agreed for decades that alliances are a source of strength for the United States and one that should be preserved. Donald Trump doesn't think so, and he has opened up this line of attack on America's alliances, and his Republican base is listening. So if you look at public opinion polling over the past four years, you see that Republicans are actually much less likely to support NATO or to support the U.S.-Japan alliance or the U.S.-South Korean alliance today than they were four years ago. The good news is that I think that the mass public tends to be pretty attuned to what its political leaders are telling them on these issues. And if Donald Trump is no longer the Republican standard bearer, I think you may see a reversion back to a more traditional GOP line on these issues, which comes closer to the Democrats line and therefore creates an opportunity for more consensus to build upon from a strategic perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, my prediction for what it's worth would be that we see, if Trump were to lose, we'll see some return to the, to the kind of more traditionalist line, but also there, there will be a kind of doubling down on the hawkish perspective within the party, trying to kind of outflank a Biden administration in every respect on China, on Iran, on counterterrorism, on that's kind of the reflexive move, it seems to me. Um, okay. Uh, back to the back to the kind of U.S. domestic uh, challenges, because one of the things you make very clear in the book is that domestic renewal at home is intrinsic to America's ability to implement this kind of strategy. And I'd like to hear you uh, think through how we go about should we go about thinking about the trade offs that are going to be needed in terms of investment on issues here at home versus uh, national security investments. Again, I'm come, thinking back to. Uh, President Obama was was uh, uh, criticized uh, from many corners in uh, tw the early two 2010s when he talked about some of his decisions like pulling out troops from Afghanistan or withdrawing troops from Afghanistan uh, and saying it was time for nation building here at home. Uh, and he was criticized in many, many corners of the foreign policy debate. And one wonders whether when we reflect on the last few years in, in America here at home, whether folks actually are arguing that we should have had less nation building at home during the Obama years. Um, but nevertheless, here we are. And, and as you point out, we have acute challenges and those have only compounded since you finished this book with the COVID crisis and the uh, manifestation of a massive economic crisis and, and things that are, we're gonna live with for the rest of our lives in terms of challenges. So but how should, how should as, a, as foreign policy leaders think through the strategic choices and these fundamental trade-offs uh, between investments here at home and what we're doing abroad? And I'm thinking particularly, say, in the defense budget. Yeah. 
Well, it's super important. And I think the fact is that we argue in the book, and I think COVID has made it very clear that there simply is no longer a distinction between domestic policy and foreign policy, because the entire source of the United States strength exists at home. And if we can't find a way to sustain that strength and leverage it for international purposes, then the US is going to become a middling player on the global stage, regardless of what kind of assets it might retain domestically. So domestic renewal is the foundational prerequisite for strategic success. And it's not easy to achieve because it's really a vast agenda. It means that the US needs to invest in key sources of 21st century competitiveness, beginning first, of course, with getting our public health situation under control and addressing COVID in a comprehensive national way so that people can get back to work and be healthy and not have to fear for their families. But it also means investing in the foundations of a 21st century economy through you know, massive infrastructure building projects, both physical and digital, and also through improvements to K-12 and STEM education and ensuring that we have a sound immigration policy in place. So all of these things are traditionally thought as not being within the purview of foreign policy, but we try to be very clear in the book that they're absolutely necessary building blocks. Now, that being said, they're not sufficient. And I think one of the big challenges that a Biden administration will face, if there is one, is to the need to, in the first instance, respond to what's now a quadruple crisis at home, where you have a health crisis, an economic crisis, a racial justice crisis, and a climate crisis, with swaths of the country quite literally on fire right now, all happening and landing in their inboxes on day one, at the same time as they need to think about these long-term investments at home, and also work to create an international order, a system of rules and norms and institutions institutions that actually befit the 21st century challenges that our country will face, and to do so at a time when China is increasingly pioneering its own alternative vision. So that is no simple task, and I think the Obama administration experienced firsthand how hard it is to juggle all of those priorities. By no means do I want to minimize it, but I think that is the scale of the charge that we now face at this critical juncture in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the same time, as you said, the, as the economic crisis settles in here, and there's just going to be further demand on on renewal here at home and rebuilding, um, uh, it's going to put tremendous pressure on the critical investments that that you argue, I think, persuasively that we need to make. Uh, okay, I want to get to transition to some questions from the audience. We got a lot of good ones that have come in. The first one I want to start with is a big one, and it's from Andre Goodfriend, who's a career diplomat at the State Department. And he makes the observation that some of the impetus behind the rise of zero-sum nationalism populism is the sense that openness is a strategy for failure and that an open society, and he uses quotes, so I'm using my air quotes, uh, is giving away, is get, sort of giving its away its intellectual and economic treasure uh, and it's unable to, therefore unable to pursue what are national interests, vital national interests. And so he asked, do you have examples of where a policy of openness has actually succeeded in pursuing one's own national interest above all versus a zero sum approach? Sure, thanks Andre for the question. And the bottom line here is that the US can only stay safe, secure and prosperous in an open world. But let's be clear about what we mean by an open world. An open world is one in which states interact with each other on the basis of principles of openness and transparency and cooperate through international institutions that are themselves open, transparent, and characterized by good governance. That means that an open world does not require that the US open itself up to, for example, unrestricted immigration or unfettered capital flows. This is not a prescription for domestic openness so much as international openness. And I think that's really important to recognize because of course, there are negative externalities to international openness. For example, if the US had fully closed borders, no travel, no trade, we wouldn't have been vulnerable to the COVID pandemic because nobody would have been able to come here from Europe or China or somewhere else. So yes, there are potential benefits to closure if you think about certain transnational threats that are themselves borderless. But the fact is that the US is actually going to be more insecure and less prosperous in a world in which we succumb to closure. And to give just one very clear example that might resonate with you, 
a massive amount of global trade transits through the South China Sea every day. If the U.S. were to accept closure in that space, which is to say that both commercial shipping and American military vessels couldn't transmit through those waterways or that airspace, that would strike a massive blow to global trade. And you have to remember that 95% of global customers exist outside of American borders. So we simply can't have a vibrant economy at home unless we're engaging with trade internationally. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. should be fighting for openness and an open world, but it should also understand where certain, especially emergency precautions are necessary. And this strategy is fully consistent with some emergency COVID measures of closure to address the rampant pandemic. It's fully consistent with an approach to supply change that emphasizes resilience in addition to efficiency. And it's also fully consistent with a sound immigration policy that regulates the people that come into this country and certainly doesn't throw open our national borders to anyone who might want to be here. So you're very astute to pick up on a sort of distinction that exists at the heart of the strategy between domestic openness and international openness. And it's important to recognize uh, where that distinction lies. Mm -hmm. And I, it, just a follow-up question that comes in from Michael Teasdale, and he talks about how that the domestic barriers you talk about, the political barriers to a more open world policy are very strong. Um, and it's, it's not just partisan politics, it's also based on a perception uh, that is rooted in reality that the middle class, the working class are not winners in globalization, that the big bet that was made 20, 30 years ago uh, has worked out poorly for so many parts of our uh, uh, fellow citizens. And that subsequent inequality that's gonna be uh, happening in the coming years because of the COVID economic crisis is only gonna make that much harder, make that more acute. Um, and so the question is, do we need to change the structure and impact of globalization and technological change, namely automation in particular, to bring more benefits to the middle and working class just to get the bare minimum level of domestic support one needs for this kind of strategy. You do talk about this in the book, so I want to give you a chance to respond. Sure, and it's just so important. And it again has to do with the fact that domestic policy and foreign policy are inextricable from each other. And so if we make certain foreign policy choices, for example, continuing to engage in international trade that may result in certain job losses at home, there needs to be a parallel domestic agenda that seeks to mitigate the worst effects of those losses on the workers, on the businesses that sustain them. So an openness strategy does not retreat from globalization, but it does seek to mold it in a way that is more beneficial to the United States. But, you know, in some ways, there are job losses and, you know, individual uh, losses and economic hardship that are simply a result of technology and automation that have nothing to do with international trade. Uh, the U.S. doesn't can't turn back the clock on innovation, but it should work to help those people who are being put out of jobs as a result of AI and automation and you know, do job retraining programs or whatever that might be. At the same time, we have to be honest that there are job losses and manufacturing losses that have happened as a result of China's integration into the international trade system. And the problem is that China, in many ways, has actually exploited the openness of the United States and also exploited the loopholes that exist in the WTO that, for example, allow China to subsidize state-owned enterprises without any effective recourse within the global trade regime. So what an openness strategy does is says the U.S. does not need to sit idly by while countries like China exploit our openness through prejudicial trade practices. What we need to do is modernize the international trade regime so that we can actually crack down on that. So what does that look like? It doesn't look like withdrawing from the WTO. In the first instance, it looks like trying to reform the WTO, for example, to work with allies and partners in Europe and in Japan to pioneer a state-owned enterprise code of conduct that makes clear that certain types of illegal subsidies that China is giving to its domestic businesses are not acceptable and actually do contravene the central spirit of WTO agreements. It also looks like pioneering new high standards trades agreements that do place American workers and American families at the center rather than prioritizing corporations, but that also use our market size as a lever for promoting better labor standards, better environmental standards, and better climate standards overseas. 
And of course, there are some areas where the US really does need to protect itself. For example, crown jewels like our semiconductor industry. And we need to take very tailored and targeted restrictions when it comes to certain forms of international exchange as it relates to those industries, understanding that they might be vitally necessary for national security, but that those exemptions should not be abused in a way that undermines the integrity of the system writ large. Mm -hmm. well you just mentioned climate leadership, and I'd like to bring in a question from a, from a student at Georgetown, uh, 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 Daniel Breslau, and he talks about, he raises the important issue of President Xi's speech last week, uh, committing China to carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, he made that speech at the UN General Assembly. And to get your, your take on that, and how, particularly how you think a new presidential administration here in the US could respond to what is China's uh, uh, real hard push to, to lead on this issue. I'm taken back to 10 years ago when I was working in the State Department and you know, we were trying, the, US, the Obama administration was trying to lead on climate change and trying to draw China into the conversation and China was very reluctant, thinking it was just a big trap by the United States to undermine their economic growth. And now here they are trying to flip, the, flip the, the switch on us and lead on this issue. So how do you see China's moves generally, but particularly this climate change announcement uh, as, as an as a effort to thwart an open strategy? Well, I don't think it is an effort to thwart an openness strategy, at least not necessarily. And climate cooperation is a central area where the US and China should seek to work together as mutual interests do dictate. So going forward, climate change obviously presents an existential threat to all of humanity, not just to the United States. And it is an area where we should be able to see cooperation, even existing alongside a more competitive international environment more broadly. Now, I know that many people who've looked very closely at China's uh, environmental and climate policies have questions about the uh, genuine nature of some of the commitments that its leadership has made to climate change. For example, there are quite a few coal-powered plants that are part of BRI. But if China is genuinely committed to reducing emissions both in its own country and in the countries where it partners for development, the United States should absolutely welcome that. That mm -hmm. won't be enough, however. The U.S. also needs to put itself back on the right side of the climate challenge by recommitting to the Paris Climate Accord, by pioneering new, better, more stringent commitments by itself and also by other major climate emitters, and also by finding ways to enforce those commitments when they are only made sort of nominally and not actually carried through on. But this is a great area where the US and China may be able to work together and certainly we ought to pursue it. Now, one more note I'll make on this, especially since we've been talking a lot about contrast with the Obama administration. An openness strategy does not think that the United States should trade away certain elements of openness in order to secure climate cooperation. Mm -hmm. So one thing that the Obama administration did to try to maintain an atmosphere of cooperation with China in an effort to get to the Paris Climate Accord was in many ways to look the other way as China militarized the South China Sea. And by establishing a clear prioritization in American strategy of the need to resist those types of attempts at closure, an openness strategy is very clear that you can't trade away closure of any part of the international system, whether geographically or technologically, in order to gain cooperation on other issues. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, because that would be, I mean, if one news, we need, if China or climate change is one of the four existential threats we, we face currently, uh, or challenges we face currently, but we should perhaps forego, even if, if forego cooperation, if it means the price being paid means a closure in a space like the South China Sea. That's your, that would be your argument. Well, we need to see where the mutual interests genuinely exist because we can't manufacture them where they don't happen. And we right. shouldn't wrap ourselves in the pursuit of convoluted linkage strategies that may or may not be accept, may or may not be successful and that allow us to trade away key dimensions of openness in the course of pursuing them. So right. if China is genuine in the types of commitments it made at UNGA last week, then we should welcome those and try to build upon them as a framework for cooperation. But we shouldn't let Beijing dangle the possibility of cooperation in front of us as a distraction 
that prevents us from responding to bids of closure and dominance that it may be pursuing in the interim. Right, right, right. Um, so you finished this book some some months ago. Uh, the, the book production process is is Byzantine and often it's opaque uh, to those of us who, who write books. Um, and of course, we had this global pandemic uh, uh, hit us uh, as the book was was getting finished and, and produced. And so to reflect a little bit on how you see the COVID crisis and how it's been playing out in terms of our broader debate about the US role in the world, the specific political debates, how that affects your views on, on our ability to, to, to answer the call that you're making in this book to pr pursue an open strategy. So I think COVID really underlines the urgency of what this book is calling for. Because in many ways, the long-term trends that we've highlighted in the book and that we did identify prior to the pandemic have been accelerated and accentuated by COVID. So you think about sharpening US-China competition and rivalry. We expected that that was going to play out over the next 10 to 15 years, but in many ways, COVID has put it front and center in American foreign policy much sooner. Similarly, partisan polarization, something that has been growing for a long time and that was already hindering the United States' ability to act internationally and domestically, well, COVID has shown it to be even worse than we knew in many ways, as the basics of our public health response have themselves become subject to partisan bickering. And Democrats and Republicans don't even agree on basic issues like what the COVID death count is and whether we should be wearing masks. Sure, so, sure. Uh, so all of this is to say that while our book didn't anticipate this pandemic in any way, it did anticipate the foreign policy emergency that the United States now so clearly faces and the need to make a new set of national security choices and also pioneer a new approach to international order that promotes the type of cooperation that is needed to address global challenges like pandemics that no single country can address on their own. And indeed, no other country has been able to lead the world in responding to. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you talk a little bit about the, in this book about the structure of international cooperation and uh, the necess necessity to reform some of our existing institutions or create new ones to better enable us to pursue this open world and defend it once, once it's up and running. So talk a little bit about some of the most important changes that you recommend need, need to be made, whether it's on the UN Security Council, the, the G7 or G whatever it would be, or something new, uh, an alliance of democracies, what have you, um, uh, to help global governance of this open world order. Absolutely. So there are a few elements to this. I mean, one has to do with reforming legacy institutions to try to make them better suited to 21st century power realities and 21st century challenges. And that would mean, for example, reforming the UN Security Council to include India. Uh, you might also rethink European representation on that council. For example, why Germany isn't a member, but the UK, no longer a part of the EU, is itself a member, as is France. You would also think about WTO reform and the need to adapt that institution, not only as we've discussed already to certain prejudicial Chinese practices, but also to expand to address trade in digital services, which is a massive and growing part of the global economy, but actually isn't covered by any WTO frameworks that exist right now. But the US would also have to pioneer new forms of order and it needs to recognize that these aren't going to come about through universal institutions like the UN, but rather we do need to see other democracies as the focal point for our order building efforts going forward. And in some cases, that may occur through institutions that already exist, like by modernizing NATO to set new deterrence thresholds in cyberspace by specifying that a cyber attack on critical infrastructure would trigger, trigger the Article 5 mutual defense commitment. That can bring legacy institutions into the new century and set new deterrence thresholds, which are themselves a form of order. In other areas, it's going to entail pioneering new norms on internet governance. 
And here actually our European allies have been well ahead of the United States through the GDPR and their own efforts to set new standards for the internet. This is somewhere where the US should seek to partner with our European allies in the EU, seek to partner with Japan and try to create a united front in a democratic vision for internet governance that stands up to the notion of cyber sovereignty and sort of data hoarding um, and, also data, and also information hoarding and censorship that um, is many cases represented by China. So it's a massive renovation project that spans everything from climate to trade to tech. And it's one that the US absolutely can't do on its own, but together with its allies and also like-minded partners who may not themselves be treaty allies, it's certainly one that we can rally the world behind. Well, this is a massive renovation project and your, your book offers a lot of really interesting and compelling ideas about uh, how to go about that. Although as we were discussing before uh, we started the, the live chat here, uh, you, what do you think the prospects of a second Trump administration would be to pick up some of this? If, uh, look, I think if, if, uh, if we're President Biden in office a year from now, one could look at, at your argument and see that in many ways as a blueprint for, mm -hmm. for that a Biden administration. Um, but how do you think this holds up in a second Trump administration? So if the Trump administration is serious about great power competition and especially serious about competing with China, it should certainly look at this strategy. Now, we need to be clear eyed about the fact that several of the fundamental premises of an openness strategy are at odds, at least with the president's instincts and worldview. We know that he has an antipathy towards allies. We know that he is resistant to international trade agreements. We know that he prefers to cooperate with autocrats than with Democrats. But nevertheless, if they really want to compete with China over the long term and to do so on a sustainable and successful basis, these are the types of measures that uh, a Trump administration should look to promote. Because the fact is that the United States faces a small and narrowing window of opportunity to revamp its foreign policy for the 21st century before it is too late. And mm -hmm. failure to do so will see authoritarians consolidate their power. It will see the international trade regime buckle amidst unfair market practices. It will see the global internet splinter into nationalized information systems. Mm -hmm. And this is a world that's much more hostile to American interests and American values. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, as we were just discussing, COVID may just be a mild harbinger of the much worse disorder that is still to, go to come if the US doesn't step up and resume its international leadership role, because it's never been clearer that there's simply no other country that can do so. China has failed in this moment, and there are no other countries that can truly ra rally the entire world to face down a borderless challenge along the lines of COVID. And we know that especially in a world of climate change, there are going to be worse pandemics, worse worst global crises still to come. And so the necessity of American leadership that is both disciplined and globally engaged has simply never been clearer. And those are the opportunities and the stakes that are going to face whichever candidate wins in November. Yeah, absolutely. So if you were writing the 100 day plan for a new administration, what is the most important thing they should do right out of the gate uh, to both show their commitment to an open world order, as well as to try to move the momentum in the right direction? Well, as we've discussed, the most important thing is getting the United States House in order at home. And so in many ways, the most fundamental foreign policy move that a Biden administration can make would be to implement a national COVID strategy and create a framework for really investing in the American people, the American economy, and the American democracy. So I would start there, but of course there has to be an international component to that as well. For example, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord to show that the US is going to lead on that kind of major international order building challenge. And also signaling to our allies that in many ways the United States is back and that we are not only listening to them, but also very eager to work together in seizing the opportunity to turn this moment of destruction into a moment of creation that benefits all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we're out of time, Rebecca. I've got one last question uh, that I'd like to ask. Um, and that is what books, book or books that you read that helps uh, helped you kind of shape your thinking about this book. Uh, 
And then what book or books are you reading now that you're finding uh, uh, helping to shape your thinking about today and the future? So the book or books that shaped this book, I mean, I think we have to give great credit to John Eikenberry um, and his book Ooh. After Victory, because that and is- Eikenberry's got his own, he's got, a, he's got another book out right now. Which... Yeah, and, and that book makes a very different argument than this book. So there's a productive debate to be had there, oh, but good. in terms of understanding where international orders come from, how they've been created, and what are the sort of key characteristics of the post-World War II and post-Cold War order, his work has been absolutely seminal and I think really is the starting point for understanding that both from a theoretical and historical perspective. Um, right now, one recent uh, sort of contemporary book uh, that I read that I thought was really terrific on these questions was Exit from Hegemony by Alex Cooley and Dan Nexon. Sure. And yep. they're, reckon they're reckoning with a lot of the same phenomena in terms of why the US-led order is unraveling, uh, but they lift up some different trends that I don't personally think are as compelling, but that are worth really considering. For example, the rise of right-wing populism and nationalism as a transnational phenomenon that is causing states to exit it from the US-led order. So that in particular, if there is a Biden victory in November, it'll be really interesting to wrestle with how powerful that thread of right-wing nationalism is in a world in which Donald Trump is no longer the American president. But it's a very rich and sophisticated book that's well worth your time. Excellent. Well, those are both, uh, both great tips. Thank you very much. But I would really encourage everyone to start with Rebecca and Mira Rep Hooper's book. Uh, Rebecca Lisnam, Listener, Mira Rap Hooper, An Open World. Uh, it's a terrific book. This would normally be the time of the program, Rebecca, where folks would line up and you would sign books. Uh, <laughs> but I would very- virtual signatures. Exactly, but I very much encourage everyone uh, to go to your local bookstore and buy a copy of this book. It's, it's uh, short, but it packs a great punch and it really is a call to arms and a blueprint for the future. And so we're lucky to have it. Rebecca, thank you for taking the time to write it. Thank you for being here with us today. I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to uh, listen in and for all the great questions. And I want everyone to stay safe and we'll look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Rebecca, thanks. Thank you so much, Derek. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Bye -bye.